Welcome to another episode of Mutual Growth, a podcast by Penn Community Bank. I'm your host, Aaron Clark. Today, we're once again joined by Dorothy Jaworski, Penn Community Bank Director of Treasury and Risk Management, to get her thoughts on the state of the economy and her forecast on what comes next. After the show is over, be sure to check out the show notes and links to resources at pencommunitybank.com slash podcast. All right, Dorothy Jaworski, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Aaron. It's a pleasure to be here. We are glad to have you back. There's a lot going on. We've uh, been trying to find a time where everything simmered down a little bit more to have you back, but that doesn't look like it's going to happen. So we figured we'll throw you right in. Right. <laughs> well, as we said, there's there's so much to, to get into, and I, I could ask a million questions, but the simplest might just be, what is going on? But We'll, we'll lay some foundational pieces um, just so folks can kind of begin to understand where we're going to go in the rest of our conversation. Um, probably the most familiar uh, item that folks are seeing and feeling in their their wallets is, is inflation. Um, can we just talk about inflation, what that is in reality now and how that is kind of playing the economic picture that we're seeing? Yeah, well, I I always refer to it now as our inflation problem. You know, we do have a problem with inflation. And it started back with the pandemic and continued on into this year. Um, both the Federal Reserve and Congress were injecting trillions of dollars into the economy. And of course, you know, direct payments to consumers and businesses, you know, from Congress led to really a lot of increased demand. You know, mostly for goods at that time, but you know, now for services. But, um, you know, so it led to shortages and, you know, there were real supply chain issues. So there wasn't enough supply and prices got bid up. Well, you know, that was going on since last summer. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, at one point the Fed said, um, you know, this may be transitory. So they didn't take any action. And probably the most, um, you know, in my mind anyway, the most egregious thing that occurred, rather than taking action to raise some rates back then, the Fed was buying $100 billion worth of bonds every single month. And they continued that into this year and they didn't end till March of 22. So they knew we had a problem, yet they continued to inject almost a trillion dollars into our economy. So, you know, we might've been a little better off had they not done that. But they started to raise rates in March against inflation. And that's that's their one tool. Um, when they raise interest rates, it, 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 the whole intent of it is to cut off demand, you know, make it more expensive to borrow, you know, things like that. So, you know, they waited too long. You know, maybe they thought it was transitory, but once they realized it wasn't, you know, they, they could have acted. But, the, you know, the reality is they're acting now and they're acting very aggressively to raise rates against inflation. Um, you know, the momentum's very hard to stop once you get there. Sure. But, you know, if you look at inflation, it's measured in many ways. But the one that most people see and feel is the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. And that, the last reading we had for that was for the month of August. And that was up 8.3%. If you strip out food and energy, it was up 63 so, you know, people are paying more for food, more for gas, you know, more for medical services, you know, just about everything. Everybody's paying more. The next reading will come out tomorrow for the month of September. So we, we will miss that. Hopefully it's down a little bit. It has been trending down slightly every single month since June. It peaked in June at 9.1%. So we are down from that, but, you know, not enough, you know, to help anybody. Um, the producer price index that came out for the month of September today, and that trended down a tiny bit again. It's 8.5 percent. And then, if you look at without, um, you know, food and energy, which they call the core, that was up 7.2 percent. So it's still relatively high. You know, it, it means the Fed will continue to act. Um, you know, one thing about Fed action too is um, they're supposed to control the money supply. Mm. And in 2020, during the pandemic time, money supply was growing at about 25% on average, which is massive. For 10 years leading up to 2020, it grew 3 to 5%, and we had no inflation. 
So in 2021, they started to reduce that, but it didn't end the year. Um, it, it ended the year at about 12%. And now, you know, the results of their tightening actions, the year over year growth is about 4%. So we're in that range where they wanted to be. So, you know, that should reduce some inflation pressures by pulling money out of the system. Um, you know, the Fed, they continue to claim they're going to continue to raise rates aggressively if they have to. The next meeting's early November. So, we'll, you know, we'll see what they do. But they have been moving in, you know, 75 basis point chunks the last three times they acted. And that that's historically high since like the 1990s. You know, we're not talking about the 1980s when Volcker was changing them by 4% in one, you know, fell swoop. But, you know, 75 basis points is a very large increase at any one time. Can we just for a second, because I know people hear about rate hikes, right? And they understand, okay, we talk about 75 basis points, but can we translate that into... All right. We know the Fed is making, uh, you know, as you said, using their tool to address, address inflation. But how does that kind of translate, you know, into folks that maybe are looking for a house or seeking lending options and, and understand rates there are also rising? Can you talk about how they're connected and kind of how they factor into a larger consumer picture? Yeah. Um, you know, the Fed controls short term rates. So when I say they're raising rates, they're raising the short term. The market generally takes care of the rest. So if you look at, you know, the treasury market, you know, those yields are up two to 3% this year from where they began the year, you know, based on the Fed moving the short rates. Um, you know, and also that's translated to uh, mortgage rates. They began this year at about three and a quarter for a 30 year. They're up to close to 7% right now. So that's gonna cut off demand for housing. It, it, you know, it's it's an affordability thing. Look at how much higher the payment could be at seven percent on that same mortgage versus three and a quarter. You know, and and you know, it'll cut down, it'll cut down the price increases on houses. They were running astronomical amounts. Like if you looked at year over year changes, and this is a national one, but you know, it got up to about twenty percent year over year price increases. Now we're down to about 13 or 14. So, yeah, that should continue to trend down. If you look at that same 20% here in Bucks County, we I think we peaked at about 14% year over year. And now that's a little bit under 10. So, you know, the price increases are taming down. And, you know, I, I wouldn't think at this point we would have price declines like outright, but, you know, that percentage change will probably fall you know for the time being at the rate of inflation because that's a normal thing you know housing prices should change at the rate of inflation yeah all, all tied to uh all tied together for sure yeah now yeah. another another thing that people have probably heard and it seems like at, at a certain level it's a semantics game we've you, you have your textbook definition of a recession mm -hmm. you have kind of the economically understood definition of recession. You obviously have the, you know, societal and political implications of are we in a recession or not? Can you just kind yeah. of give us an understanding? Are we in a recession? Are we heading towards one? What what can we say about recession? Yeah. Well, you mentioned, you know, there's a couple different ways to look at it. Um, if you look at, if you open your economics textbook and look at recession, it says it's two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. Well, we had that in the first and second quarters. We had negative 1.6% in the first quarter and then negative 0.6 in the second quarter. Now, the third quarter is projected to be maybe up a little bit. You know, it, it's, it's uncertain at this point because um, not all the data is in at this point. But, you know, so some people are saying, look, we have a recession. But there's an entity out there called the um, called NIBR, National Bureau of Economic Research. They're the ones that actually call the recession. And they have really four criteria they're looking at. They look at, um, you know, whether production is falling. Well, we've seen that in GDP. Manufacturing, you know, those types of things are falling. Um, they look for falling real incomes and We've seen real income, and that means income minus the inflation impact. 
So real incomes have been falling for about 18 months straight. Hmm. So that's another criteria met. The third one is falling real sales. And, you know, minus inflation, we would be negative. Um, you know, so that criteria is met. And the fourth one is they want to see unemployment rising. Well, you know, we're not seeing that yet. Employment's usually a lagging indicator. Um, and sometimes there'll be like a, a final flurry of hiring, you know, to get yourself ready for the recession, you know, <laughs> like just to make sure you have the talent there. So, um, you know, that one has yet to be met. So that's why there's been no official declaration. You know, you talk about society and politics. We have the election coming up in November. I highly doubt they would come out anytime, you know, before that and say, oh, we're in a recession. So, you know, they're going to wait probably a quarter or two and watch that unemployment. And if that is rising, you know, then they'll, I think they'll have to declare it. Gotcha. And now, as we see, you know, if we're if we're trending towards a recession, is that something that we anticipate being localized to the, the U.S.? Is this a global recession? And kind of how does that interact with some of the economic factors like inflation that we talked about? Yeah, well, um, we're not alone in in, you know, facing recession. And, you know, so, you know, I guess I'd agree with Niber. We're not in one yet because of the employment situation. You know, it's fairly it, it's it's not weak by any means, but you know that could change in a heartbeat. The, um, actually, there was one piece of data that came out the other day: job openings, as reported by the Commerce Department, and job openings for the economy fell a million during the month of August, from 11 million to 10 million. So you know that that's happened in one month. So you know it's a frightening sign. You know, if that would, you know, pick up steam. Um, but, you know, we're not alone. Europe and Asia are facing worse problems than we are because of energy situations, Russia, Ukraine, all, you know, all that type of thing going on. Um, you know, so the trends favor slower growth anyway, you know, aging population, things like that. Um, you know, and actually, I was reading an article about low inflation in China. They're facing recession. So, you know, their inflation is falling because of that. And they're the manufacturer for the world. So when we go to buy products from them, if they're keeping prices low, that could really help us here. You know, so there's a lot of things going together on this, you know, inflation. But, you know, when you have recession, it naturally reduces demand and naturally reduces inflation continues to be all connected <laughs> for sure all right so hopefully hopefully people have now kind of a basis for our discussion um which is an, and something that i always look forward to because you talked about lagging indicators but we always want to look towards our leading indicators right right and you always touch on your leading economic indicators can you remind us what those indicators are and kind of what are they telling you right yeah i always look at leading indicators because you know it's fine to know what happened. Like, okay, the CPI in August, you know, it doesn't matter what's going to happen, you know, come Christmas time, you know, people want to know that. So I look at a few of them. Um, you might have to edit that out at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on one second. Okay. We'll see. Okay. But leading indicators, um, I look at a handful of them. And, you know, the first one I look at, the, the markets are telling you what they think. The biggest one is the stock market. Now, we are down, you, you know, I don't have to remind anybody how much we're down this year. You know, NASDAQ's down a third, you know, 33%. The Dow's down 20 and the S&P somewhere in between. So those markets are saying that the future is not looking all that bright for them. And they look at prof corporate profits and they think corporate profits will be down. You know, that's that's the message from stocks. Bonds can also tell you a story. The shape of the yield curve is, you know, it's not always the absolute level of rates. It's the shape of the curve. And you in a normal environment, you have an upward sloping curve. People think rates are going to rise. The economy is going to grow slowly. You know, all that um, long rates are higher than shorter ones. We're facing situations now where the short rates are starting to exceed the long rates. And right now it's evident in the 10-year versus the two-year treasury. 
at September 30th, that was negative 45 basis points. And the highest it's been before a recession in the last, like, you know, 15 years or so was negative 56. So we were approaching that level. Um, the Fed also looks at the yield curve and they use the 10 year and the three month as their indicator. That's still slightly positive at this point. So I would say when both of those um, terms turn negative, then I believe recession follows. Historically, that's always been the case. Um, another indicator, um, the conference board, you know, they're an economic research firm. They come out with what they call leading economic indicators. And that's supposed to show you what they think, you know, what the index shows as future growth six to nine months from now. Because that's how long it takes Fed policy to really take hold, six to nine months. So that has been negative and trending negative um, for almost this whole year. August was down 0.3, negative 0.3%. So, you know, it, the, the trend is continuing, pointing to, you know, slightly negative growth in the next six to nine months. There's also a leading inflation indicator that I, I really like over time. You could see it really turning up last year, you know, telling the Fed, you know, inflation's coming. You know, maybe that transitory wasn't, you know, wasn't the right thing, you know, to do. But since May of this year, it started to turn down year over year. May was down 1% and August, which is the latest reading I saw, was down 3.2%. So that's giving a tiny bit of hope that maybe inflation's on the downtrend. Um, and then, you know, there's surveys that get released, manufacturing surveys and services surveys. Those are showing weakness. You know, the, the trending has been down on those numbers like month after month. So that's certainly not showing optimism in the economy. None of them are at real like total recessionary levels yet, but they're, you know, they're heading that way. What so it's not, a, not the greatest picture in the world you know, for slowing growth and hopefully slowing inflation too. Speaking of slowing growth, one of the things that you've always been, you know, quick to point to as as a drag on growth, even in a hot economy, right, is is the, the national debt. I'd be interested, you know, you mentioned ramping up stimulus spending through the pandemic and potentially continuing that too long. Um, how are those expenditures kind of continuing to balloon that national uh, debt how does that impact growth right now? And will that continue to be maybe an increasing drag on growth even after uh, emerging from a recession? Yeah, um, that's a good point. Usually in every presentation I ever do, I show the levels of debt. Now, let me take you back to um, 2010 to 2020. We had a very long recovery from the Great Recession in 2008. GDP in 2010 exceeded 90%, which is a key benchmark, or debt levels exceeded GDP by you know over 90%. We had slow growth of about 2% during that time. Right now, the you know the US debt has exceeded $30 trillion. And that's 120, you know, 120 some percent of GDP. So that should put further drag you know, being a higher percentage than we had than when we had the 2% during that recovery. So, you know, my prospects are, if we see 2%, that's great, but we might see a little bit less, you know, long-term. You know, any growth is good, but, you know, it's gonna be slow and, you know, small. Well, while it seems like a lot of things are kind of trending downward, one thing that, that you've pointed out that isn't is the strength of the dollar. Um, can we talk about what that means for the kind of lay person when they hear, hey, there's a strong U.S. dollar? Uh, how does that translate into the, the economic picture that we're paying? Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting. Um, my boss, our CFO, Charles, and I were looking at returns on different asset categories for like the first, second and third quarter. Third quarter, just about everything was down except the U.S. dollar. It's up 17 percent, you know, year to date, which is, you know, massively huge. Um, but what that does, if you have a strong dollar, it keeps inflation at bay. You know, it keeps it lower than it otherwise would be. So we have an eight percent inflation rate, 
without that strong dollar, we would have seen, you know, increasing import prices, you know, and raising it even more. So it, it did cushion us a little bit. So we were better off than, you know, than most, um, you know, and even in the um, investment world, we're here in the U.S. investing U.S. dollars. You know, our dollar got stronger. If you're in Europe, you know, and in, you know, looking at the U.S. dollar, your currency is falling tremendously versus, you know, our U.S. dollar. You know, the euro mm -hmm. is a one to one to the dollar. And that peaked at like 1.4 a couple mm -hmm. of years ago. You know, so they're struggling with more inflation than we are. You know, is the bottom line. It cushioned us a little bit. Right. It, we we often hear that the the U.S. dollar is you know a reserve currency, right? It's it's kind of a global a global currency. Do you in this period of economic disruption do do we have a reason to think that that might not be the case? Or we is the strength of the dollar now a good sign moving forward that the dollar will continue to be a reserve currency, or is there enough disruption or other factors that that might not always be the case that this hegemony that we've become accustomed to? Yeah. Well, it might not always be the case, but you know, they've, you know, around the world, they've seen the strength of the dollar time after time. Um, you know, we're in a better position, even though we're facing recession, we're in a better position than most of the rest of the world. So, you know, with that strength, you know, um, I, I think it will retain its reserve status, but you never know, you know, with the conflicts with Russia and, you know, the disagreements with OPEC over the, you know, number of barrels they're going to produce and all that, you know, you just don't know whether they'll keep using the dollars as much as they have been. You know, um, we know for sure that Europe, Europe, we can't use theirs as the reserve status. Theirs is way too weak and they're facing energy troubles and everything sure. else along with the recession. And just two weeks ago, there was trouble in the UK when their government announced another stimulus program and the market went, you know, went berserk, for lack of a better word, they had to go out and start buying bonds to rescue their bond market. Mm. People were just dumping bonds. It was just unbelievable. So they had to come and intervene. So we can't use the British pound either. You know, would you use China's currency? I don't know. They're, you know, it's, it's too much fluctuation, I think. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's really not any other, you know, Japan has been out of the picture for 30 years with slow growth. You know, so I, I don't know that there's a real solid alternative, you know, to the U.S. dollar. Well, now the, the moment that everyone always waits for, Dorothy, when we when we have our quarterly conversations here is as we sit here today, you put on your put on your uh, magician's hat. You look in your crystal ball here sitting in October. What do we think the outlook for quarter four you know, kind of holds and what maybe can folks expect moving into 2023 and potentially a recession, but a whole host of other factors that we just discussed. Well, I don't want to be too depressing. I'll start out with that. But I mentioned earlier, um, you know, Fed policy, when they raise rates, it takes six to nine months to really filter through. So we have not seen the effects of any of their large increases in May, June, July or September yet. So I think the economy is going to falter in the fourth quarter and into the first quarter next year. Just really slow growth. It could be potentially negative because of all those increases. We just don't know. You know, so I'm, I'm an advocate for maybe the Fed to you know, do their next increase, but then just wait and let a little time go by to see what they've, you know, what they've done, you know, in terms of um, slowing the economy. Um, but unemployment will probably rise. You know, the first reaction of companies, you know, as they're doing, their stocks are doing poorly, sales are weakening, you know, their profits are gonna weaken. They're, one of their first things is gonna to be to, you know, look to where they can cut costs. And sadly, layoffs is, you know, one of the first things. So I think we'll see that pick up. We have already heard many announcements of that. And then a lot of companies put on hiring freezes Mm -hmm. So you know, that's going to hurt employment also. Um, short rates, the Fed has said they want to get to 4% or above. So we're now, their Fed funds rate is at three and a quarter right now. So it's expected by the markets that they'll do another 75 in November, we'll be at four. 
and then you know take it from there what what they'll do at the next meetings but you know i firmly believe they should pause and see what they've done you know it could be a disaster otherwise and then um you know i i do believe recession's coming i can't say it's going to be a disaster or whether it's going to be just a shallow one you know it's just looking at all the data all the historical things the inverted yield curve the message of stocks leading indicators growth is going to be negative you know for a period of time mm -hmm. you know so i think that's going to occur in 23. i think you'll see that organization declare that recession you know has started and they may backdate it mm -hmm. they may come out in march and say recession started in september you know that's that's one of their normal patterns that they've done is kind of go back a little bit but um you know it given those four criteria we're not seeing employment bad enough for them to declare at this point so that i do understand why they haven't come out but um you know not to be all that depressing but you know i just a lot of people say recession's inevitable all those kinds of things well if recession's inevitable so is recovery right after that so, you know, I always look on the bright side. Yes, it's going to go down. But, you know, then at some point, everybody sees that, you know, the worst is over, put it that way. So recovery will come too. And that could all occur next year. You know, stretch it out a little, maybe 23 and 24. Or, you know, 23 is a poor year and 24 is the recovery. You know. A, a bit of a... A ray of sun there in an otherwise yeah. gloomy economic uh, <laughs> for, forecast. They, but, they, uh, they call economics the dismal science for a reason. <laughs> it's it's not every podcast where a guest says, "I don't want to be depressing," but <laughs> but uh, I often feel like it's my job to put the depressing news out there that everybody hears it, understands it, and then they can move on. <laughs> you know, so. If nothing else, hopefully folks that have listened to this kind of understand a little bit more of some of the key words or phrases, they have now an, an idea of some of those economic indicators that they can be keeping a, a look for. And I know mm -hmm. we'll, we'll be monitoring them inside. We'll continue to look for, you know, updates from, from you and uh, the rest of the organization. But Dorothy, I, I, as always, I really appreciate you taking a few minutes to to get us up to date and uh, take a look into the future. And we'll be sure to have you back, uh, whether it's the end of this year or early next year to uh, see what's uh, down the road next. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Aaron. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks, Dorothy. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Mutual Growth, a podcast by Penn Community Bank. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a rating. And as always, keep up with the latest from Penn Community Bank by following us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. For more information about this podcast, links to past episodes, or to learn more about Community First Banking, just visit pencommunitybank.com slash podcast. Mutual Growth is the official podcast of Penn Community Bank, member FDIC, equal housing lender. It is produced for the benefit of current and prospective customers and partner organizations. This program is provided solely for educational and entertainment purposes. The information contained herein is based on sources believed to be reliable, but is not represented to be complete and its accuracy is not guaranteed. The opinions, views, and estimates expressed are those of the presenters at the date of production and are subject to change without notice. Please email marketing at pencommunitybank.com regarding booking or repurposing any part of this podcast.